You ever done something and then go back about a week later and go, why did I do that? Well, I did that with the intro to my sermon this morning. I wrote it last week, and it made a lot of sense to me, and it felt like it was going to fit perfectly. And then when I started to go over my sermon this morning, I'm like, why did I do that? That makes no sense at all. But I got nothing else, so uh, you're going to have to bear with me, right? Um, it's, I start by saying this. I don't know much about Chinese in fact, I know nothing except compound beef is really good, and General So chicken is amazing. And if, if I'm really in a hurry, beef lo mein is off the hook as long as you use a lot of soy sauce. But anyway, uh, in the Chinese language, I am told that the word in Chinese that they use that's the English equivalent, crisis, actually has two meanings. Okay, the first is the same one that we understand, you know, uh, impending danger kind of thing. But the other definition that they use for the word crisis doesn't make a whole lot of sense right off the bat. And that is opportunity. The word crisis in Chinese means opportunity. So I want you to hold on that for a while. We'll come back to it in a few minutes. Ten months ago, something happened. Tragedy happened here in the United States. It was on May 24th. 2022, uh, you saw it in the news. It was another one of the mass shootings we've had. It seemed to be so more common nowadays than they ever were before. This was the one in Uvalde, Texas. If you remember that, killed 17 elementary, uh, 19 elementary students and two elementary teachers, and wounded 17 other folks there at the school. The the young man who committed that atrocity. He doesn't deserve for his name to be mentioned, but anyway, it was Salvador Ramos. He was 18 years old. And as the story unfolded on the news, three facts came out very quickly, which quite honestly are the same three facts that come out at every mass shooting. First one was that he was known by law enforcement. He had a record as a juvenile, and so local law enforcement knew this kid. Uh, the second one was that... Um, determined real quickly that he had a mental deficiency. He had a mental illness. And the third one is what the anti-freedom people capitalize on every time there's a mass shooting, and that is we need more gun laws. You knew that was going to come out. The politicians jumped on their soapboxes, I mean, literally while they were still cleaning the scene saying, you know, we need to have stronger gun laws, we need this, we need that. And I'll be the first one to tell you that the Uvalde one was, was, a, was a cluster. It was jacked up from the get-go from the get -go, uh, to let somebody with a weapon run rampant in a school for as long as they did before law enforcement went in to stop him was a travesty of justice. It was horrible. But every time we have a problem like that in our society, the anti-freedom people jump right up. And they want to legislate it. They want to say that if we had more gun laws, these kinds of things wouldn't happen. And what they're really wanting to do, whether you realize it or not, I look around this room, most of you uh, either are familiar with weapons or you own weapons. They're trying to take your freedom away. And you would never, ever, ever consider going to a school and shooting a child. But you're the one that would suffer with those kinds of, of laws. And that's the problem that we have. Every time we have a, 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 a tragedy in this world, a crisis in this world. And I was sitting there thinking about this this morning. And the truth be told, there is no way we will ever be able to legislate evil out of our society. It's not going to happen. I don't care how many laws we have. And then my brain went to where my brain normally goes, thinking about what if we could? And, and so I went there. You know, I follow my brain wherever it goes. I went there with my brain, and I came to this realization. If we could legislate evil, Jesus wouldn't have had to come. Let that sink in for a minute. If we could legislate a way evil, so there's never any more evil on this planet, Jesus wouldn't have to come because that's what God law was supposed to do in the first place. But the fact of the matter is evil's here because the evil one is here. And here's the deal. If you believe there's a God in heaven, 
you better believe there's a Satan on this planet. And don't, don't fall into the trap that they're equal because they're not. Okay? God is the creator. He created the universe. He makes the rules. Satan is part of his creation. If you don't know the story, you can follow the story in the Old Testament. But Satan, Lucifer, was at one time the most glorious angel in all of heaven who thought he was better than God. And because he thought he was better than God, he was kicked out of heaven. And he has become who we know of as the devil or, or Satan. But the fact of the matter is there's evil here because the evil one is here. Okay? So... I said all that to say this. I'm in a series that I started 10 weeks ago today, and I'm going to try to connect the dots. Just hang with me. Uh, I started 10 weeks ago today a series that I so creatively call Ephesians. Isn't that an amazing name? And uh, what we've been doing is we've been looking at this little book that's in the New Testament. It's actually a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the churches in and around Ephesus somewhere between 60 and 62 A.D., and what we've discovered over the last 10 weeks is this is a powerful, powerful little letter. There's, it is chock full of stuff that is so valuable to you and me as followers of Jesus. It is so valuable in teaching us how we're supposed to act as believers. We've learned in this letter that we were chosen by God, that we have a purpose, that we were created specifically for a purpose. In this letter, Paul has taught us how we should be praying, what we should be praying for, how we should be acting towards a lost and dying world. It's just been a powerful, powerful uh, time that I've spent uh, doing this. I hope you've enjoyed it. The one thing that I have noticed, and I've said it before, but it is so true, I never have gotten as many comments from you guys, either from text or emails or phone calls or stopping me in the lobby or I had, had one person stop me in Walmart to tell me how much this was changing their life, how much this series had impacted them. And that's exciting. I feel very strongly that near the beginning of the fall of last year, God really impressed on me that we needed to walk through this book this year, along with the book of Philippians, which you're going to be doing a little bit later on in the year, that I, I feel like God is really showing us something. I think that it's valuable for you and me as followers of Jesus to understand what it is we're supposed to be doing in the first place. So we've been doing that for 10 weeks. we got a couple, three more weeks to go in this series and then when we end up the series it'll be Palm Sunday and next week will will be Easter so I'm excited God has been rolling God has been moving and we've been learning a lot of stuff as we've walked through this now here's the thing that I've thought about a lot in this and that is this idea of legislating evil You know we're in a battle. You know we're in a war. There's a spiritual war raging in the heavenlies. And, and that spiritual war has at its very core our soul. Satan would do anything and will do anything he can to rip us out of God's hands. Satan will do anything he can to keep people from turning to God. And this war has been going on since the beginning of creation. And it's going to continue to go on it, it it's just it's a tragedy it's what it is and the fact of the matter is the kingdom of darkness satan's kingdom they actually know how to wage war better than we do they do i mean they understand what it means to capitalize on a tragedy they understand what it means to capitalize on a crisis and i can guarantee you they will never let a crisis go to waste They'll figure out a way of capitalizing on it. And, and I was thinking about this. You know, the truth of the matter is this. God doesn't need to know anything about warfare at all. He is the creator. He made the rules. He's the one that established everything up front to start with. In fact, <laughs> you understand God could snap his fingers and there'd be no more universe. He could snap his finger and there'd be no more Satan. There'd be no more evil. There'd be no more nothing. Just poof, gone. He could do that. However, the Bible shows us that one of God's most favorite names is a military title. It has to do with war. It's a military title. That name is Jehovah Sabbath. And that means the Lord of hosts 
which is a title given to a military commander. So that's one of his names. God knows spiritual warfare. God understands it perfectly. The thing is, he expects you and I as his followers to know a little bit about it. Also, you know, he's put us on this planet right smack dab in the middle of the arena of the war. Now, it's not a physical war, but it's just as deadly. He put us in the middle of the arena of the spiritual war. How many of you brought your Bibles this morning? If you brought your Bibles, hold them up. Old school's got pages and covers. New school's got screens. If you're new around here, if you just hold up your smartphone, I'll think you're holding up your Bible. We use an app around here called the Uversion app. It's an amazing app. It's available whether you have an Apple product or an Android product. If you don't know about the app, ask your neighbor next to you. They'll explain it to you. They'll show you how to download it. If you download it and open it up, my notes for this morning's sermon will be right there on your device. That's pretty cool. So what we want to do is we want to look at God's word. And uh, I want to start by getting away from Ephesians for a second. I want to look at another letter that Paul wrote. In fact, it's the second letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. Because it's a great example of God telling us how we should wage war in this spiritual battle that we have going on. So I put it in your outline. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Here's what Paul said. For though we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. See, the Bible teaches you and I that we need to become more smarter, more wiser. How we conduct ourselves concerning this spiritual war that we're all in. Whether we want to be in it or not, we're already there. And so the Bible wants us to be as smart as we possibly can, as wise as we possibly can. The Bible tells us that this is a war, even though it's spiritual in nature, that has weapons. And these weapons can hurt us. It also tells us that the enemy hates us. The enemy hates us and would do anything he can to destroy our walk with the Lord, to destroy us physically. If he could, he would. And it also tells us that there's going to be casualties in this war. There's going to be casualties. And the Bible tells us also that this war has set itself up to determine you and I's very survival, both on this planet and in an eternity. And what you and I have to do, if we say we follow Jesus, if we say we are believers, if we say we're born again, or if we say we're Christians, or whatever that word is you want to use to distinguish that you have a relationship with him, if we say we're them, then we need to walk through this life understanding that we're Christian soldiers, that we're very much a soldier in this war. We don't have a choice. The moment we accepted Jesus, we got drafted into the, the good side. The day before we accepted Jesus, we were already drafted into the dark side, okay? There's not really a choice because we're on this planet. The choice is which army do you fight for? But we need to be Christian soldiers. And quite honestly, we need to go around as if we are navigating our way through a minefield. And that if we stick our head up, there's a sniper waiting to shoot it. That's how we need to go around. That's how we need to approach it. And we need to understand how we need, how we need to act. We've got to be really careful. And how uh, we got to understand how we walk in the world that you and I live in today. At the beginning, I said, I use this term crisis. And the fact that in the Chinese language, crisis actually means an opportunity. Well, you and I are in a crisis right now. We are in a crisis, but instead of trying to avoid the danger, my challenge to you this morning is let's look at this crisis as an opportunity, as an opportunity for you and I to show the world Jesus. So that brings me back to the book of Ephesians and what we're going to be looking at this morning. Ten weeks in, and we're finally into the fifth chapter of this letter. Um, 
I want to start kind of like in the middle of the chapter, though. I want to look at verses 15 through 17. It says this, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. If you're taking notes with a pen and you've got the outline in front of you, circle or highlight that phrase, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. I, I see the way that ends, and here's my ADD kicking in. I don't remember a lot about school, but I remember you're not supposed to end sentences with is, but Paul did. But that's what he meant, okay? We need to not be foolish. We need to understand what the Lord's will is. See, if you've been watching this, we've been walking through this book of Ephesians. All the way up to now, Paul's had a tone in his teaching. And what he's been doing is giving us some understanding about who you and I are in Christ. About how we were chosen to be followers of Christ. How we're supposed to act. What's expected of us. But it shifts in the fifth chapter. He now starts talking about being in a war. He now starts talking about there being a real battle going on that, we're have to, that we have to participate in. And if you stop and think about it, that's how it is in the military. That's how it is at the police department. You know, if you join the military or you, you join a police department, you got to go through a lot of training before they give you a gun. Okay? And you got to go through a whole lot of training before you ever get to pull the trigger on that gun. And it's the same here in the Bible. There's a lot of basics we have to figure out first. I mean, in the military, you're taught all kinds of stuff first. You're taught how to wear a uniform correctly. You're taught how to march correctly. You're taught how and who to salute and when you're supposed to salute. And, and you're taught how to stand. And basically the same thing is true in law enforcement. You're taught how to wear that uniform. And you're taught the law. And you're taught all this stuff before they ever give you a weapon to use. And the Holy Spirit does the same thing for you and I. Here in Paul's writings, you know, we're learning the basics here. In a couple of weeks, two weeks from now, when we end this series, I'm going to end this series talking about the full armor of God and what that means. And some of the armor of God are defensive weapons, and some of the armor of God is an offensive weapon. But see, before we ever get to put the armor on, we have to understand the basics first. And so that's where we are this morning. There's a few things that I think you and I need to learn as, as Christian soldiers in order to survive and also, get this pun, thrive on the battlefield. Okay? So if you got your outlines, let's just jump right into it. I got to tell you as a disclosure real quick. My staff was freaking out this week. Because if you look at your outline, it's short. It's short, okay? There's only three fill in the blanks. When I sent my outline to Sue, she was like, is this all of it? <laughs> Holly and, and, and Cindy wanted to know if I was okay. And, and I really struggled. I'm going to tell you what, all through Monday, I was threatening to throw this away and start over. And Cindy, is she in the room? Cindy, I see you back there. Cindy said, use it. God gave it to you. Use it. And I'm going, oh, 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 and she's going, use it. Oh, oh, oh. So I listened to her. By the way, she's one of my day nags, okay? Um, I didn't give them that name. I did not give them that name. However, so here's the disclosure. Yes, it's a short outline. You still ain't going to beat the Baptist to the buffet, okay? That's my promise to you, and I'm going to stick to it, all right? Okay. All right, got your outlines. Let's jump into this. Every Christian soldier needs some stuff. And the first thing that a Christian soldier needs is to be careful how they live. Every Christian soldier needs to be careful how they live. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is one of the reasons the church has lost its effectiveness in the world today is because I have. I think you have too. We've gotten sloppy how we live. We give the enemy ground and don't even realize we're giving the enemy ground. And, and we all do it. I do it. Let me give you a great example. There's nothing better on this planet 
than a Hershey's Kissy. Can I get an amen? amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. And listen, listen, at, at thanks, not Thanksgiving, with the holiday we just had, the loved one, Valentine's. At Valentine's, they make Hershey's Kissies that are white and chocolate at the same time. And they are amazing. I love them. And then I, if I told you the other candy Hershey's makes, Twizzlers. Has there ever been a better liquid than Twizzlers? Come on now. Jolly Rogers. I mean, Kit Kat bars. Come on. I mean, I'm telling you, this is good stuff, right? Well, did you follow the news this week about, about Hershey? If you haven't, let me bring you up to speed real quick. This, this week, they launched their national campaign for the International Woman's Day, highlighting the accomplishment of women, which I think we should do every day, not just one day a year. But nevertheless, they chose as their national spokesman, and I said that right. A person by the name of Faye Johnstone. Faye Johnstone is a transsexual, trans right activist who they're marching around as the perfect example to celebrate International Women's Day. I thought I was reading a joke when I read the news report. And you know what? When the church and Christian people pushed back, you know what Hershey did? They pushed back harder and said not only did they chose choose her, she was the perfect example to celebrate International Women's Day. The question I have is how long has Hershey been supporting stuff that is contrary and counter to God's word and we didn't know about it? I love Kissy's as the most bestest candy in the world. I'll never buy another one. Never. See, there's all kinds of stuff like this. We support streaming services because it happens to be the only streaming service that has that series that we cannot live without watching. And so we watch it and we pay for the streaming service and we blow off the fact that they're supporting some something out there that is contrary to God's word. But we give them our $14.99 every month. Or... We buy clothing or shoes from a brand who, who gives millions of dollars to the wokeness campaigns. Or, or we plan and save all year long to go to a theme park that shall not be mentioned in Florida. Who cares more about the LGBT world, Q world than it does about Christians. And we give them our money. Do you understand what we're doing? Do you know what we're doing when we do that? We're buying ammunition for the enemy. We're loading their gun. And we're pointing it at ourselves. Waiting for them to pull the trigger. Listen to me. The other side. The world of darkness. They, won't, they will not miss an opportunity to take you out. But we've gotten sloppy. We're helping the enemy take us out. Because of what we do. Now the thing is. I'm not. Gosh please. I'm not telling you how to spend your money. I'm not telling you what to do for your vacation. I'm not telling you what to do for entertainment. Please don't think I am. Okay. What I'm telling you is we all need to think about where our money goes. And what we invest our time in. And here's the deal. If you stop that streaming service. Or you stop eating Hershey's. 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 You stop eating kisses. 
You stop buying those clothes because your pastor told you to. You don't get no reward for that. You get nothing for it because I ain't got nothing to give you. But if you stop eating Hershey's Kissies or going to that theme park or buying those clothes because you want to please God, he will reward you. He will bless you in this life and in the life to come. Okay? But we've gotten sloppy. We help the enemy. I got nothing else to say about that. Uh, in Romans, another letter that Paul wrote to the church at Rome. Paul, in, in Romans chapter 1, don't believe me, go look it up for yourself. Okay? He talks about how society, our culture, has disintegrated into chaos when we allow sin to creep in and we allow, I love this word, debauchery to creep in. In fact, I gave you the last verse in that little reading, but you go look at 18 through 31 on your own. Here's verse 32 from Romans chapter 1. Paul says, They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. I looked at this verse in the Greek, and I used to think that just sounds so good. I looked up this verse in the Greek. Y'all can do that too, because, you know, they have a strong concordance of the Greek and the Hebrew to English, plus Bible Gateway online, you can do that. And that's what I did. I went to Bible Gateway, and I looked this verse up. And the English word we use in this translation that says encourage, we encourage others to do so, ain't strong enough. It's kind of underpowered for what it really means in the Greek. Uh, and what Paul was really saying, a, a, a direct translation from the Greek to the English would have been strongly, enthusiastically supports and encourages those to do the same thing. So it's not just encouraging them. It's supporting them. It's enthusiastically getting them to do those things. Again, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm not telling you what. I'm, I am not telling you how to lead your life. I'm not going to do that. Okay. But I think it's important to understand we're in a battle for our souls. And the enemy would think, wouldn't think twice about taking you out. Yet we are aiding the enemy when we give our money and our time to things that don't honor God. I'm just saying, I'm going to move on. I think that's where the kingdom of darkness is smarter than we are. They know how to manipulate us, and it seems so innocent. Here's the deal I know for a fact. The enemy of darkness would not give us any help. They would not use any resources towards the kingdom of light. They wouldn't. We got to live our lives the same way. I got to move on. The second fill in the blank for you guys is make the most of every opportunity. This sleeve is bugging me. There, I feel better now. How y'all feel? All right. Um, this one, this was a hard one for me. This is a hard one for me. Most guys, most guys here. And maybe some ladies too. We view ourselves through the lens of what we do to make money. That's where we derive our self-worth from. That's where we see our importance coming from how we make money. I mean, and I can only speak from the, from the public safety side of this. But I know as a police officer, I know it's true. I know for firefighters it's true. For EMS people it's true. We wear stuff that indicate what we do. And if we're not wearing something that indicates what we do, we've got it on our car. You know, my little solstice, I got the thin blue line on the back of my little solstice because I can't, you know, but it's a little, but it's there, you know. And, and uh, a lot of times I wear a thin blue line bracelet and my license plates say, heroes live forever. And it's, a, it's for police officers that died in the line of duty. But we do that. Firefighters do the same thing. Is Jason in here this service? I know he was around the building. Jason's on, my, on our security, on our protection team ministry. Jason's a firefighter, EMS guy for the city of Suffolk. Sometimes Jason will wear T-shirts that you know, indicates he's a 
firefighter. Uh, nurses do the same thing, you know. You write, you're, behind, you're following a nurse in a car, and she's got like specialized license plates that say like RN forever or something on it. Um, we do that. Why do people do that? Why do we wear the, that paraphernalia? Why do we put that stuff on our vehicles? The answer is simple. We're proud of what we do. You know, I, 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 I was a, an adjunct in, uh, at St. Leo for almost five years, and there it was expected of you. When you go to work for St. Leo University, the first thing they do is give you about 10 T-shirts, a couple of sweatshirts, and a hoodie, and say, wear this stuff, you know? They put bumper stickers on your car when you're not looking, you know? But the, the whole idea is, and, and we wore it proudly, and the reason for it is I was proud that I was working for this university, but we do that a lot. We, we, we're proud to represent things we think are important in our lives. We're, we're, we're happy to do that. We want people to know because this is a big deal for us. I remember when I first became a believer, I acted that way. Man, when I got saved, first thing I did was I threw away all my secular music, man. And I went out and bought Christian music. And I'm talking about back in the day, okay? I'm talking about Keith Green. I, I bought every album Keith Green ever produced. And that's, after, that's before I found out you could get them for free because he gave them away. But I was paying for them, okay? Um, I, I remember getting Amy Grant albums, and I remember falling in love with her. I had such a crush on her. She was so hot. But, um, and, and then there was this young, upcoming guy named Michael W. Smith, and, and, and there was a rock band in Christian music, sort of. Um, they were called Petra, and I think they were rock because Petra means rock. And, and then I was reminded between first and second service, Stryfer was there too, but there won't nobody to compare to Skillet of today, okay? But I remember I was wearing the WWJD bracelets, and I had me a 105-pound Schofield reference Bible, and I carried it everywhere I went. And you wouldn't listen to me. I beat you with it, okay? Uh, that's just, oh, man. But somewhere along the line, that stopped. And I thought about why did it stop? I got tired of listening to Christian music. I wanted to go back and listen to some of the headbanging music that I liked. I got tired of wearing the Christian t-shirts because I realized I was doing stuff that weren't really Christian. And I got to the place where I was embarrassed to be seen around other Christians because I didn't line up no more. And I got a feeling a lot of us don't wear Christian marketed stuff because we don't want people to know because we got one foot on one side of the war and one foot on the other side of the war. We got to get back to doing that. Now, I don't mean we got to get back to carrying the Schofield Bible and beating people on the head. In fact, you do that. You better not tell them you're from here. Because if you do, I'm going to heal you in the name of Jesus. And if I can't heal you, I'll get Guy to heal you. He's the head of my security team. He's big. He can heal most people. Okay? But, but here's the deal. I mean, it's like we can follow Jesus and not be obnoxious. Dawn, I told this story before, but Dawn and I, uh, when I had my little Audi Roadster, we decided one night it'd be cool to go down to Virginia Beach. It was in the summertime, have the top down and just kind of drag the beach and be cool, right? And we got stuck at a stoplight, and this dude literally was on a, a milk crate preaching the gospel, right? Telling people they were going to hell and all this stuff. And he turned and looked at us and made the assumption, because we're in this little Audi with the top down, that we were heathens and going to hell. He started preaching to us. I have never been so embarrassed in my wife in my life. Now, now somebody in first service said if Dawn had been wearing her first lady t-shirt, they'd have known we were she was a pastor's wife and they'd have shut up. But I couldn't believe the thing that, that just clicked for me that night was this girl, and you could tell she wasn't a believer just by the way she was carrying herself, what she was carrying in her hand, and how she was walking, and the words that were coming out of her mouth. It was pretty clear she wasn't a Christian. But as she walked by our car. She made a comment and used a string of cuss words to that guy. And I thought to myself, if there was ever a chance for that lady to find Jesus, he just, he just screwed it over for her. So don't, don't go to the beach and stand on a street corner 
and let anybody know as you're preaching hellfire and brimstone that you go here. Don't, because I want people to come to Jesus. I don't want people to be repelled because of Jesus. Actually, they wouldn't be repelled because of Jesus. They'd be repelled because of you. Okay? My, I'll get off my soapbox now, right? However, where was I? Oh, yeah, we got to make every opportunity. Okay? We do. We do. We have to make the best of every opportunity that, that, that God gives us. We've got to help people find Jesus, and we've got to help them Find them in a way that they don't drift back like I did. I lost 15 years because I found Jesus and then drifted back into the world. We need to get back to that. Not carrying the Bible, but being representatives of Jesus. Helping people see Jesus in us. You know, Billy Graham is the one that said, you might be the only Bible a person ever reads. I asked this question last week. If they open the pages of you, are they blank? Or is there something really there? Are you taking every opportunity to help people find Jesus? It might be the cashier at the, at the Walmart. The guy or girl that's checking you out at Walmart. And you see the misery on their face as you're being checked out. Have you ever thought about what's going on in their life? Have you ever asked them? Have you ever just said, you look like you can need a prayer. Can I pray for you? I know that's hard, okay? I don't do that well. Dawn is amazing at that, okay? I, 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 we used to get to go backstage a lot, Christian concerts, because one of my friends, John Bates, works for The Current, which is a Christian radio station. He was giving us backstage passes to literally every concert that came to Hampton Roads. And so we got to be backstage with some really cool people like Michael W. Smith, like like uh, Toby Mack, like Skillet, um, like Lauren Daigle. I mean, all these people. And every time we're backstage and I'm in aw- I mean, I'm just awestruck. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm standing on the same planet in the same space with John Cooper from Skillet or Toby Mack is standing there, and he's only four years younger than me. That blows me away. Uh, But anyway, I'm standing there, and I don't know what to say. except, And Dawn will step right up, and she goes, Hi, Toby. What can I pray for you for? And I'm like, that's my wife. You know, she did ask Toby that when he was here last time he was here uh, several years ago, and and he was in a really bad place at that time. Uh, It was spring break, and he had to bring his children and his wife with him on tour, and he said that meant that they had to get another tour bus and that he was dealing with kids. Now, this was before they were older, so they were younger, and all of them were on tour, and he was having to deal with them, and he said, he just looked at Dawn, he squeezed her hand, he said, I just need patience. I'm going to kill him. And so there's my wife pray, laying hands on and praying over Toby Mac. I'm not that good. I don't do that. But maybe we should learn how to do that. At least be sensitive enough to know there's something going on in their life. And maybe you're the only person that cares or even notices for that matter. We need to take every opportunity we can. We just need to do that. Listen, you got to get rid of the attitude that that's the pastor's job because it ain't. I showed you guys last week, my job's to equip you. Your job's to do the ministry. You may be the pastor in that situation. You don't have to be the guy on stage to be the pastor in somebody's life. You're as much in ministry as I am. Let me give you an example. You know, here's the deal. I talk about this kingdom of darkness. But the Bible tells me light overcomes darkness. It's a it's a law of of science. Darkness does not overcome light. I'll give you a great example. I know most of you in this room are Washington Commander fans. If you're not, I'll pray for you. But hush. I want, I want to take you to Landover, Maryland. I want to take you to FedEx Field. I want to take you down onto the field at night. I want to take you to the 50-yard line. And as I take you there at night, there's no lights on in the stadium, so it's dark. But the moment we get to the 50-yard line, they lose power in all of Landover, Maryland. So it is pitch dark. You got the picture? If you take a birthday candle, 
little birthday candle, and you light it at the 50-yard line, every seat in that stadium will see the light. The darkness cannot overtake that light. In fact, that light has overtaken the darkness. So no matter how dark our world gets, if we have a light in us, if Jesus is in us, we have the power to overcome darkness. We need to make every opportunity or take every opportunity to let our light shine. I got a light. My light's name is Jesus. It's just that simple. John 1, chapter, uh, one, John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 says, In him there, is, there was life, and that life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overpowered it. Here's the thing you need to understand. The enemy can't change you. A lot of people think he can. Satan does not have the power to change you. Our job is to stand firm and to shine our light in his face. I don't care if the darkness seems overwhelming or not. The light always wins. And we need to stand firm. Finally, let me give you the third one and then we'll wrap this up. The third fill in the blank is this. Christian shoulders need to not be foolish. We need to use God's wisdom. I want to go back to the scripture I read at the beginning of the, of the sermon this afternoon, this evening, tonight, whatever it is, wherever we are, Monday, if you're in Ukraine. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, 15 through 17 says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what God's or the Lord's will is. That word foolish there from the Greek doesn't mean to lack knowledge. It has nothing to do with lacking knowledge. It's tied to your actions. It has a strong moral sense to it. So in other words, I can give you the Pastor Steve paraphrase of that verse, and it's this. Let your actions reflect whose you are and what you believe through the wisdom that God has given you. That's what that verse is saying. And, and that's an awesome promise. But there's even a better one found in the first chapter of James. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. What that verse says is this. Listen to this. This is so cool. This is a non-negotiable Bible promise. It's non-negotiable. This is a prayer that if you pray it, God is always going to answer it in the affirmative. He's always going to say yes. If you ask him for wisdom, he's going to say no. No, that's not true. He will always answer in the affirmative because he wants you to have it. Here's the cool thing. When you ask for God's wisdom, you get all of God. You can't just get his wisdom, okay? When you pray for wisdom, you get all of God. You get every piece of him that comes with it. He's going to come rushing into you, not only bringing you wisdom, but he's also going to give you his courage. And not only is he going to give you his wisdom and his courage, he's going to give you his wisdom, his courage, and his strength. And not only those three, he's going to give you his might. And not only his might, he's going to give you his power. And not only all of that, he's going to give you his presence. And I'm going to tell you what. You can charge hell with a squirt gun if you got God. It's that simple, okay? He's going to give you the courage to stand firm no matter what crisis you're in. No matter what situation is going on in your life. Whatever the crisis is, he wants you to make the most of it. It is an opportunity. It is an opportunity that God wants us to take. So he's given us some action items here this morning. Number one is we need to be careful how we live. That's important. Number two, we need to make the best of 
every single opportunity he presents us. And number three, we need to ask for and use his wisdom. We got to stop giving the devil ground. We got to stop letting the, the devil take the hill. And most of the time we do it and we're oblivious that we've done it. What I'm asking you to do is this. Think about what you do. Think about what you say. Think about how you spend your money and your time. And let your light shine. Even in the midst of darkness. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for who you are. I thank you so much for this letter. This letter is so full of wisdom, Father. This letter is so full of how you want us to act as followers of you. How you want us to act as believers. How you want us to act and carry the gospel forward. Father, my prayer is this, that you make up the difference between what I'm capable of doing and what you've called me to do. And that you make up the difference for all of us for what we're capable of doing and what you've called us to accomplish. Father, I just pray, Lord, that we become more, just more aware of the times we give Satan ground. And Father, help us keep from doing that. You're an amazing, amazing God. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.